It'll be a great night. All right, we're going to talk to you from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. I don't think we'll get through the whole thing. Uh, I, I, if I do, I'll be racing like a racehorse, and I don't want to do that to you. I want to take my time with this. So let's pray over the word, and then we'll see how far we get. Father, we ask you to bless this word with your anointing. Make it real to our hearts. Give us revelation, Father, from the Holy Spirit. If I don't say what you need said, speak it into our hearts anyway. Take what is said and use it to bring revelation into the life and heart of every believer and every non-believer. May they find God through this message tonight. May you move upon us with your power. May there be great glory upon, uh, upon the Lord Jesus Christ by what is preached tonight. And we offer this to you in prayer, and we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now the boy Samuel was in the service of the Lord under Eli. Now this is very careful. Pay attention here. Be very careful with this. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were no visions breaking through. So it was a spiritually dry time. My introduction is what's wrong with this picture. Limited activity of the Holy Spirit is not normal. Be a good place to say amen. It's not healthy to not have frequently moving of the Holy Spirit, frequent moving of the Holy Spirit. Limited flow of the Holy Spirit activity is not what God expects, wants, or how he prefers to operate. God's expectation is there should be movements of the Holy Spirit. There should be times when there's waves of his Holy Spirit's presence here in the house of God, but also in our lives. God wants to move not only in his house, but in the marketplace. His expectation is that there will always be movements of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always active among men. So Holy Spirit activity, signs and wonders and miracles, yes, to the nations and to the people of the world, should be going on. Words coming forth that encourage and direct his people. Dreams and visions, we're told in Acts chapter 2 and Joel 2, 28 and 29, that when the Spirit was poured out upon humanity, that then young men would dream dreams and old men would see visions, and upon your handmaids I will pour out my Spirit, saith the Lord. There should be prophetic dreams and visions flowing forth upon men and women of earth. The absence of this activity is noticed and despaired of by the Holy Spirit in verse 1 of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3. You can hear the lament of the Holy Spirit. He's grieved by this because it is not normal. God is saying this is what is, but this is not what's supposed to be. God's voice should not be silent toward us or in our lives or toward our people or toward our nations or upon this world. God desires to move and speak through all of us who are preaching his gospel and those of us who are sharing our witness in the community. Spiritually dry worship and spiritually dry living, spiritually dry practice, brought a spiritual drought of the Holy Spirit's activity. There was no action on the part of the Holy Spirit. The prophets were not prophesying, and consequently no visions were breaking forth at all. Now this doesn't speak to us of anything but our need to stay fresh with God. Israel had been let, had been, the spiritual condition of Israel had been left to itself under the leadership of Eli the priest, and it decayed under his leadership. And that's evident by the things we see later on in this chapter. The people were not prophesying, there were no visions breaking forth, so stay fresh with God, stay connected to the vine where the Spirit can move and flow through you. We know that the Spirit wrote this, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, because the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the words that we read in the Bible, we believe they're alive. That the Holy Spirit breathed upon men, and the breath of God moved them to write the things that they wrote, either historically or prophetically. It's recorded because God wanted us to have it. The key is they were moved by the Spirit. The same thing we read of in Acts chapter 2, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit fell on the the earth for the very first time. 
God poured out his Holy Spirit. We also read that they were moved by the Holy Spirit and they uttered forth phrases that could not be known, but they were uttered by the leadership and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They were unctioned to move that way. This is the benchmark for yesterday's church. The Old Testament is not absent of the Holy Spirit's activity. The difference is in the Old Testament is not believed that the Holy Spirit indwelt men, but that he moved on them. They experienced the anointing of God. They experienced the breath of God. They experienced the leadership of God. And they experienced the inspiration of God to write down the words that we have in the pages of the Old and New Testament. <clears throat> and it became the benchmark for the church to observe the move of the Holy Spirit among us. So it's the benchmark for yesterday's church. And you already know it's the benchmark for today's church. Do we expect the Holy Spirit to be active among us? And he expects to be active among us. We expect prophecy to flow, the word of God to flow among us, and to be elevated among us, and rehearsed among us. We need to remind each other of what the word of God says. When we go through difficult and challenging times, we need to remember that God has not forgotten or forsaken us, that he said he'd never leave us or abandon us, that he, if anything formed against us, he would not let it prosper. If God be for you, who can be against you? In all things, nay, in all things, we are overcomers through our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to speak to each other the word of God, which is the word of life, and remind each other that no matter what the devil has slung in our way, our God is greater, and he is able to defeat every foe. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Such was not the case in Israel during the time of Eli. Chapter 3 picks up with God introducing himself to one who would lead Israel back to where it should be. One day, Eli was lying down in his place, now his eyes had grown dim so that he could not see, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. Samuel was lying down in Adonai's temple where the ark of God was. Then Adonai called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he replied, I didn't call. Go back to sleep. Leave me alone. It's not written, but it's what's implied. So he went back and lay down. Then Adonai called Samuel yet again. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I didn't call, my son. Go back to sleep. Now I know parents, and about this time parents are ready to say, Get back in bed. Now Samuel had not experienced the Lord yet, since the word of Adonai had not yet been revealed to him. Adonai called Samuel again for the third time. So he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. It's interesting, isn't it, that he can recognize that? Because he was so disconnected from God by this time, Eli was, that he was really not much good to the body of Christ and to the work of the Lord. Though he let his children grow up corrupt in the temple and ministry, though he still had enough wherewithal to realize what was happening to Samuel, I believe it's because it's what used to happen to Eli. He used to hear the word of the Lord. He used to hear the voice of God speak to him too. But it's been so many years since that happened, he was dry. But he recognized what was happening in the moment. And the word of God was given and the vision thrived in Eli's life and ministry earlier. But now it's dried up. Eli instructed his young prodigy to recognize and respond to the voice of God. Now it's interesting to me and I love it. Because something every one of us needs to know, experience, and learn is how to mute your cell phone in the church. <laughs> it's something every one of us needs to know and experience is how to recognize the voice of God. Amen? Some have lived their entire Christian life and never heard his, never heard his voice. They never had a moment where they can say, I feel God leading me. How tragic that we live all that time under the blood of Jesus Christ and never intimately know him strong and close enough to hear his voice leading and guiding us through this life. Then Eli said to Samuel, go back to sleep. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went back and lay down in his place. Then Adonai came and stood and called as at other times. Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. In order to hear the voice of the Lord, 
How do you discern the call of the Lord? In order to hear the voice of the Lord, you've got to tune your ears to his frequency. Because he's broadcasting. He's speaking. He's moving among you. He's moving in your family. He's moving in your life. He's moving in miracles. He's moving in power. He's moving in the world. He's revealing himself to Muslims in dreams. God is moving. In order to hear the Lord's voice, we must tune our ears to his frequency. We've got to tune out the world and tune in the spirit and train ourselves to recognize the voice of the Lord. I assure you, he is broadcasting. Our response, once we realize what is going on, should be that of Samuel's. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. One of my favorite passages of scripture is found in Acts chapter 9. After Saul has been converted to the Lord and he's sitting in his house there in Tarsus, or in Damascus, rather, and he's blinded. He can't see. And the Lord is just downloading information to him and vision to him and telling him what he's going to do. And he calls on Ananias, God does, and he tells him, I want you to go lay hands on a man named Saul of Tarsus and pray for him. And Ananias, who's just heard the voice of the Lord, he knew how to recognize the voice of God, objected and said, wait a second, I might die. He has license to kill Christians. And you want me to go put my face in front of his? He said, don't worry about a thing. I got it all covered. He's been converted. You must go lay hands on him and pray for his healing and pray for him to be filled with the Holy Spirit for he's going to be a great vessel for me in the kingdom of God's work. And so and then he said, now go. He heard that voice of the Lord too. So you can recognize the voice of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord will speak to you. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Train yourself to know God's voice. I mentioned to you last week, though Eli was not up to the task, he still managed to teach Samuel some things about the Lord. Even though God was finished with Eli and his family line, and though Eli had been told none of his family will live to an old age, he remained as a leader and a tutor to Samuel until he died. What he teaches him here is invaluable. How to recognize the voice of the Lord. Have you ever asked yourself that question? Has anyone ever taught you how to do that? This is the most invaluable gift you can give yourself. The ability to recognize God's voice when you hear it. Especially the ability to know God's voice distinct from your own inner voice. Did you hear what I said? To know God's voice distinctly separate from your own inner voice. Because there is a fine line there. You will hear God speak to you in your inner voice from time to time. Yes, that's possible. But then there will be leading from the Holy Spirit and pressure Holy pressure to help you recognize this is the Lord speaking to you. It's different than your inner voice. Some people experience God telling them no by giving them a gut check. Butterflies in their stomach, hesitation, a voice inside saying, wait, this is not the way I want you to go. And then other times you'll hear his voice whispering in your ear saying, this is the way, walk you in it according to what Isaiah prophesied. So you especially know, have the ability to know God's voice distinctly from your own is a very special gift, which is difficult because sometimes God uses your own inner voice. It takes training on your own, spending time with God in prayer. Spending time with God in prayer enables you to recognize his voice above all the din, above all the other voices in your world. The more you spend time with him, the more intimate he becomes to you and you to him, then that enables you to recognize his voice and hear his voice more easily. Spend time with God in prayer. And soon you'll begin to hear his voice. The ability to discern when God is asking or directing you to do something, or go somewhere, or give something, or not to buy something, or not to do something, is freeing. It's not bondage, it's liberty. You're being led by the Holy Spirit. It's life-giving and life-changing to you and others who are impacted and influenced by you. Eli knew what to tell Samuel because Eli recognized God in the moment. He knew that voice. He knew what he was experiencing. Even for all Eli had not become, he still recognized what was happening even though he himself was being cut off. So he instructed the young man, this is how God moves. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to answer. Don't be afraid to do what he tells you to do. Tell him your servant is listening. And obey what he says. Receive that word. You'll be glad you did. Here was God's message to Samuel. 
Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone that hears it will tingle. It's something so new and so different. It's going to blow your mind. If there was an emoji for this, it would be in the Bible. Try to keep things current. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity that he knew about because his sons brought a curse on themselves, yet he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Hallelujah. Recognize when to deliver a message from God. One of the scariest moments for me ever is when someone comes up to me and says, I've got a message for you from the Lord. Because you never know where they're coming from. You don't know if they've had a bad spiritual experience and they've always been negative their whole life and they've been attacked and they become an attack dog. And that's not what prophecy does in this modern day and time. It serves to edify the church and edify the saint and do effective work for God. It's, if you give a judgment prophecy, it's, that's very rare. And a lot of times that's in the flesh. But in the Old Testament, the, th- the, pro- the prophets used to thunder against the sin. And even in the modern world, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, through the modern time under grace, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, God uses the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge to have people minister a word to you. But it, you want to be careful with it if you're, if you're able to do that, if you're called to do that and you lead, are led by the Lord to do that, because you don't want to break the spirit of the person you're to address. If you have a corrective word for them from the word of knowledge, what's going on in their life, God's got this plan for them, don't do this, let God lead you here, then that's, that's cool, do that. But make sure you do it in such a way that you're tender in your delivery and not if you've got a thing that the Lord has shown you that they need help with, Blast them and come down on them. Because God doesn't do that to you, and you wouldn't want someone to do it to you, and you wouldn't want it to do it to someone else. Recognize when God's telling you to deliver a message. Sometimes God tells us things we don't want to hear, things that are uncomfortable, even might frighten our soul a bit because of who the message is about and what the message says. Samuel was in a tight spot. He never encountered a moment like this before. Can you imagine? I remember a time someone that is considered a a gift, had the gift of prophecy, came to the office and told me the pastors of the community need to do this, 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 and this. And if they don't, there's going to be judgment from God. And I called a couple pastors and I said, I just had a visit from so-and-so, and he said this. And one of them said, yeah, he just left here. I said, what do you think? He said, that's not God. I said, no, it's not God either. I said, I think God would tell us first what we were supposed to do. And he wouldn't do it with that tone. Timing is everything, though. Samuel was in a tight spot. He'd never encountered a spot like this. Can you imagine what he was going through? Samuel lay down until the morning where he opened the doors of the house of Adonai. But Samuel was afraid to tell Eli about the vision. After Samuel got up, Eli called him over. Can you imagine what this young man is going through? We don't know how old he is. We believe he's about 15 or 16 at this point. He's probably wondering, will he kill me? Will he have me wiped out because he's going to be wiped out? You can imagine the tension in the room that morning. Eli called him over and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. He said, what is the word that he has spoken to you? He said, please don't hide it from me. May God do so to you and even more if you hide anything at all from me that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing. Then Eli said, he is Adonai, and he do what is good in his eyes. There's nothing like flexing little muscle. When you're an old man and you got a little kid standing in front of you. That's sarcasm, by the way. If you have to force it out of somebody, that's not really the best way to get it. Samuel's heart was broken. By what he had to reveal to Eli and what God was going to do, his heart was broken. The whole situation was a heartbreak to Samuel. It was a heartbreak to God. The message was not a feel-good message. A man was just told its entire family line is going to be wiped out. Generationally, he will not have an existence. He wasn't glad to deliver it, Samuel wasn't, as he laid, out that, laid it all out there. He was hesitant to reveal to Eli what God had said until Eli forced him. You never want to be the prophet that has to give a message like that. And if you enjoy those, if you're the kind of person who looks for those moments where you get to blast somebody, 
you're not serving the same God I am. Because those are moments where you should break and be broken before God. Because you're not glad that that person is stumbling and falling. You are sorry for them. You hurt for them. You ache for them. That's a message that's to be delivered under prayer and with tears and with humility. You know that God doesn't want that to happen. He does tell people things they need to know, but his delivery is always gentle with his people. It broke God's heart. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all that night. This was after Samuel, Saul had been anointed king. And God lays it out there. It repenteth me. I looked it up from the Complete Biblical Library Bible. When God says it repenteth me, it means I am grieved. God says, this hurts me. See the heart of God and the heart of Samuel? Neither one of them were happy to give these messages. Neither one of them were happy about the situation. They weren't like, oh, goody, he's going to get his. And his kids, those rascals, they deserve everything they get. And that's what sometimes believers do. Is we shoot our own wounded. And it's not good that we do that. These kind of messages are brought with tearful eyes and a soft heart, for they know the amount of remorse and anguish that God is experiencing, as well as his child that is being corrected or rebuked or told he's going to lose his whole generational downline, as well as the giver of the message. It's heartbreaking to do that. There's one other thing. I didn't look up the scripture reference, but in the book of Galatians, I believe, the Bible teaches, I think it's chapter 6, that if the Lord leads you to go talk to someone about something he reveals to you that's wrong in their life that needs correction, you're to go to them with a spirit of humility, a spirit of softness, a spirit of brokenness. You know why? That verse says, pray that the same thing they're going through doesn't happen to you. So we can come on really strong when we're feeling good with God and we're really strong with God one day. And we may not always be that high, but sometimes we hit those highs and we think, hey, I can go tell anybody anything they need to hear. If the Lord tells you to do that, just remember that there but for the grace of God go you and I. And so keep that in mind. Eli wasted his opportunities. He wasted a lot of his life. We'll pick that up next week after we hear from Sarah Keck and we'll finish this out. But we understand something. The Holy Spirit can speak to us what he needs to speak to us through dreams and visions, through downloading into our spirit, through his word, through a brother or sister that's moved to some reason they don't even fully understand. They come to us and open up to us that God has put them on our minds, their minds, us on their mind. He can speak to us in any measure of ways. He can speak a firm message to us. He can speak a soft message to us. But be open to the voice of the Lord. And God will use you to deliver messages of health and life and strength, encouragement to people. We need to encourage one another. People are weary these days. They're tired. They've been through COVID. They've been through tornadoes blowing their church down. They're going through hardship financially because of inflation. They've got difficulties that we can't imagine. There are lost people out there that are hurting, and there are saints that are out there that are hurting. Be the light in the world that you are called to be. And let God use you in the right way. Again, if you're the kind of person who enjoys delivering the messages of condemnation, ask yourself why. What does the Lord need to do in your heart? I don't want to live like that. I don't want to live my life expecting to be the judge of everybody. I like to think we're all covered by grace and by the blood of Jesus. And there's not one of us perfect on this earth. We all make mistakes and we all need help. We all need someone to come alongside us, put their arm around us and say, I see that you're hurting. How can I pray for you? How can I help you? Rather than judge whatever sin we think is in their life, we open up our heart to their heart and we grow closer together. We become knit like a church should be knit together because we know we all need that kind of encouragement and lifting up. Samuel wanted to give Eli a better message than what he had to give him. I can guarantee it. And it grieved the heart of God, too. Remember, when people fail, it's not just them that are broken. God's heart is broken, too. Because he knows they're better than that. 
He's put his life in them. His spirit is in them. They can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. And that's what they need to be reminded of. Pick up the pieces. Put them back together. Love them like they should be loved. And build the kingdom of God.